Good morning, everyone. This is Julie McDonald with Microcom Technologies, and I'd like to thank all of you for attending today's webinar with MetaGeek. Today's host is Casey Cathy. He is their customer experience specialist, and he'll be presenting today. If anyone has any questions, please feel free to submit the question box and Casey at the end of today's presentation. Casey, thank you so much for being with us today. We appreciate your time and your presentation. Um, I am finished for now, so go ahead and take it on over. Awesome. Thanks, Julie. Uh, today I'm going to talk about the uh, the products that MetaGeek sells and uh, kind of go over a bit about how they help uh, with, with Wi-Fi troubleshooting. Um, so first, I'm going to introduce myself, kind of talk about MetaGeek for a bit. Um, we're going to go over some Wi-Fi fundamentals and then kind of go over the three software products that we sell, and that's Insider, Channelizer, and IPA. And then uh, at the end of this, of course, we'll go through some questions and I'll kind of answer uh, any questions you guys might have for me. Uh, so about myself, uh, my name is Casey. I am the CX specialist here at MetaGeek, which just stands for customer experience. Um, I have my CWNA, SP, and AP. Um, these are certifications put on by a company called CWNP, which I, I highly recommend checking out um, uh, to further your knowledge about Wi-Fi. Uh, you can also find me on, on Twitter at Kathy Fi. Um, Twitter has a really uh, a large user base of uh, uh, professional Wi-Fi, uh, you know, installers and network admins, and and uh, and we we call them the Twitter Roddy, and they uh, uh, they know a lot about Wi-Fi. So if you have any uh, questions about Wi-Fi or or you know an access point or things like that, um, check out the people that I follow. They're all usually uh, re really great resources for Wi-Fi knowledge. Highly recommend that. I work for a company called MetaGeek. We're based in Boise, Idaho. Um, this is a, a picture of our office over here in the bottom right, um, downtown Boise. Um, it's a, a great place to live. Uh, right now it's snowing, so that's uh, not my favorite part about it, but um, that's okay. A little bit about Wi-Fi. Uh, one of the most important concepts um, to kind of understand about Wi-Fi, and this is important to really understand how our tools work, uh, uh, the, the most important concept here is that Wi-Fi is half duplex. But what does that mean exactly? Um, to kind of help uh, uh, kind of conceptualize this a bit more, we have to think about a, a Ethernet cable for a minute. So an Ethernet cable is uh, uh, two pairs of, of twisted copper cable like this. And what this allows is traffic can go in both directions at the same time. Wi-Fi, on the other hand, uh, it is not like this. Wi-Fi is more like a single lane highway where direction can only go one, traffic can only go one direction at a time. Um, and, uh, and this is pretty important to understand um, when, when you think about devices on a channel, right? So only one device can talk at a time. So in this example, we'll, we'll take this uh, uh, little uh, uh, cell phone here. Uh, when it begins a conversation with an access point and the access point starts sending it some data, all these other devices, let's just say this is a laptop and another cell phone and, uh, and some sort of other device here, they have to wait their turn to talk until this conversation is over with this client device, you know, whether this is a, a someone's cell phone or laptop. Um, so it's actually pretty miraculous when you think about it uh, that Wi-Fi works at all in, in, in this sense. I want to talk a bit about the bands that are licensed to be used uh, for Wi-Fi. Um, we use the 2.4 and the 5 gigahertz band. Um, and some advantages of the 2.4 is that um, it has a higher range. And so if you if you look at the actual wavelength of the 2.4 gigahertz band, it's much longer. Um, if you if you were to measure out this wavelength here, you would find that this is about five inches five inches long and uh and uh so again it has a really long range about 300 feet indoors and it goes through walls that penetrates things a lot a lot easier um of course everything works with with the 2.4 gigahertz band chances are if you have a wi-fi device it's going to work in the 2.4 gigahertz band um, as a result it's super congested with with wi-fi um, if you pull out a spectrum analyzer, which is something that MetaGeek sells, you'll often find that the 2.4 gigahertz band is going to be saturated with, with tons of stuff. Um, not only Wi-Fi, but non-Wi-Fi works here as well. Um, because it has such good range, you'll see you know, baby monitors, cordless phones, they all operate using this same frequency band. 
Um, and so you'll, you'll see a ton of that stuff out there as well. Um, also, there's only three non-overlapping channels in the uh, 2.4 gigahertz band. That's 1, 6, and 11, which we'll get to a little bit more later. Uh, the 5 gigahertz, on the other hand, uh, 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 if you were to measure this one out, it's a little bit shorter. It kind of looks more like this. And if you were to measure out the wavelength here, uh, you would find that this is about 2.5 inches or so. Um, so it's a lot shorter, and as a result, it has a lower indoor range. Um, so we're talking about 90 feet or so indoors. Um, things like walls, uh, it can't penetrate that as well. Walls will attenuate the signal. So you have to keep that in mind if, if you're deploying a, a 5 gigahertz network. Also, not all devices support the 5 gigahertz. Um, usually only higher-end laptops and things like that, they're, they're always going to have this 5 gigahertz capability, but lower-end devices like a, a cheaper uh, cell phone or a cheaper laptop that, you know, they want to save some costs by including just a basic chipset, they might not support this 5 gigahertz band. So it's really important to know what your client population looks like um, if, if you are planning on deploying a, a 5 gigahertz network. There's a lot more room in the 5 gigahertz band as well. So as opposed to the three non-overlapping channels, there's 24 uh, non-overlapping channels in the 5 gigahertz band. So um, tons of uh, uh, tons of room room there. I kind of want to go over the the history of Wi-Fi as well, um, and I, I won't get too in depth here. But of course, Wi-Fi was first uh, uh, invented in 1997. Um, they just called it 802.11 Prime, and uh, and the very first modulation scheme that we used was called direct sequence spread spectrum. And you don't have to know that, but what, what is important to know is that on a spectrum analyzer, this kind of uh, uh, shows up like a curve shape, kind of like this. And, uh, and that's important to know. And if you're looking at a spectrum manager, you'll still see this curve shape today uh, because we still use these, these, these lower data rates. And then in 1999, we came out with uh, uh, 802.11a operating in the 5 gigahertz band. And then we started using this orthogonal frequency division multiplex modulation scheme. Again, you don't have to know that. Uh, but what's important to know is that it, this produces a more linear kind of haystack shape, kind of like this. And, uh, and and so if you see these two different shapes, you know that one of them's being, uh, you'll see that one of them is, is using the higher data rates. That's kind of all you need to know. Uh, this modulation scheme just introduces higher data rates, more throughput, things like that. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that uh, we're actually gonna be coming out with uh, with AX here soon enough. And, uh, and uh, the, you know, it, some stuff is already starting to roll out here in 2019 now. And, uh, and one thing to keep in mind is it's still going to keep that same exact shape. Um, it's going to operate in the 5 gigahertz band, and uh, our, our products, MetaGeek products, will be able to see that uh, since we just sell a raw spectrum analyzer. So we're always going to see that uh, AX information um, as long as your chipset uh, in your computer can uh, uh, be AX compatible. Uh, our software will also display that for you as well. It'll show the, the actual AX. Um, so kind of uh, focusing on the 2.4 gigahertz band here, um, I, I kind of mentioned earlier that uh, uh, there's only you know three non-overlapping channels. That's one, six, and 11. Uh, it's important to remember that this entire band here from here to here is 60 megahertz wide. And there's only five megahertz of separation between each channel. So again, as a result, you really only want to deploy networks on one, six, or 11 in the 2.4 gigahertz band. Um, We'll, we'll kind of go over the uh, 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 differences here uh, of why that's important. Um, so uh, there's there's two types of uh, uh, basic Wi-Fi interference. There's co-channel interference and adjacent channel interference. And uh, and uh, if you had to choose one, you, you always want to go for co-channel. And again, that's why we always say 1, 6, or 11. If everyone selected 1, 6, or 11, we'd all be happy because all that would be uh, uh, present would be co-channel interference, which is, is, is much more polite than adjacent channel interference. Um, a, a way I kind of like to uh, uh, liken this is uh, co-channel interference is a lot like uh, sitting down at the dinner table with your family. And uh, everyone kind of takes their turn to talk, but you're kind of polite about it, right? Um, everyone hears each other, and, uh, and, and it's not, not so bad because everyone can, can listen to someone else, and then when it's their turn to talk, they can speak. Adjacent channel interference, on the other hand, 
this is kind of like having uh, your family at a dinner table at a restaurant. So there's other tables around you. And as those tables are starting to chatter and talk a little bit loudly, your table now has to kind of talk that much more loudly. And, and you, you kind of start yelling over each other by the end of it because you're just trying to compete against the noise here of these other networks. Um, that, that's, that's a lot how adjacent channel interference works. It's not as polite. Whereas co-channel, all your devices, all your all your uh, uh, clients are essentially, you know, waiting their turn to talk since Wi-Fi is is half duplex. Um, and so, uh, uh, one thing that spectrum analysis is good for is it sees these two different types of uh, of, of interference, uh, the co-channel and the adjacent channel interference, but it also sees this non-Wi-Fi interference, um, things like uh, baby monitors and cordless phones and um, you know, Xbox controllers, for instance, they're, they're non-Wi-Fi devices, uh, but they still talk on that same spectrum that Wi-Fi uses, and a spectrum analyzer uh, will see that information. And so uh, 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 Wi-Fi scanning is done with the chipset in your, uh, your laptop or your cell phone, and, uh, and it'll show you these networks, and it'll show you the signal strength of these networks that it sees, and it'll show you the SSID and, and various things like uh, data rates. But what spectrum analysis will show you, and this is our, our Y-SPY device, which I'll kind of uh, uh, illustrate to you guys uh, later, um, uh, spectrum will actually show you the radio frequencies. And so this exact same graphic shows you that there's some sort of device right here, some sort of non-Wi-Fi device right here, just, just completely wrecking channel 11. And, uh, and this would be completely invisible if you didn't have some sort of spectrum analyzer uh, like the Wi-Fi DBX. Um, uh, I kind of want to cover Wi-Fi coverage as well. This is probably one of our most viewed articles online. Um, uh, that, that, and so I think it's kind of important to go over, but uh, uh, what's a good signal strength to shoot for? Well, here at MetaGeek, we really like this negative 67 dBm signal strength. Um, it, as long as you're getting a negative 67 dBm signal strength from your router, or your access point, uh, chances are you're going to have, you're, you're going to be great. You're going to, your, your Wi-Fi is going to work really well. Um, as soon as you start getting a little bit lower to negative 70, negative 80, uh, you're going to start dropping frames, right? Um, so if you were having like a Google Hangouts chat with a family member, uh, the, the, the video frames might start dropping out at around negative 70 to negative 80. Um, voice is, is always weighted a little bit more, so the voice will still come through, but your, your, your video might start lagging. Um, if you were streaming Netflix, it might start buffering at around negative 80 or so. So as long as you can maintain this negative 67 dBm signal strength, you're in, you're in uh, good hands there. So I want to go ahead and uh, uh, demo Insider Office for you guys and uh, uh, kind of show you what, what, it, what it's really good for. All right. So when you first open the tool up, um, it, it's going to show you everything around you, right? It's going to show you all the networks around you. Right now, I'm working from home, and so my network is called Kathy Fine. You can actually see right here the chain link. So this means my computer is currently associated with Kathy Fi. And so to kind of get rid of the noise, if I just wanted to troubleshoot Kathy Fi, uh, we have a really great filtering tool. So I'll just type in Kathy here, and uh, that kind of gets rid of all this excess clutter. And now I can just focus on these two. Uh, these two radios right now that are that are broadcasting. Um, right now, I'm using an Apple Airport uh, router at home here, and uh, it broadcasts a 2.4 gigahertz band and a 5 gigahertz band. And uh, Insider Office just really shows you this stuff really well, really quickly. Um, it's you know as soon as you click on this SSID, it starts showing you the signal strength over time. Um, so if you had multiple access points, you could actually walk around and see these two uh, signal strength bars or charts kind of dip and raise and lower depending on how far away or close you are getting. Um, it's also good for locating, you know, rogue access points, for instance, as you can just start walking around and uh, and kind of see uh, where, where where an access point might be just based on the signal strength alone. And of course, it gives you a ton of, of really great information. Um, and then, of course, I don't have a spectrum analyzer plugged in right now, but I'm going to go ahead and plug in our Y-SPY DBX, and you'll kind of see what this starts to do here. Um, and uh, and it, it, you see this color kind of filling in down here at the bottom. So right now, it's just sweeping the entire 2.4 and 5 gigahertz band, and, uh, and this kind of unlocks this channels tab up here as well. And so I'm going to go ahead and click on this channels tab and kind of show you um, um, some pretty neat things. 
that uh, uh, inside our office will start to calculate for you once you have a YSPI DBX spectrum analyzer plugged in. And so um, first, let's just focus on the, the 2.4 here. So I'm going to kind of draw a line here between the 2.4 uh, and the 5 gigahertz band. Um, so it, it's this channel utilization right here. This is the, your actual uh, usage in terms of spectrum uh, analysis. So how much the channel is actually being utilized. And so if I were to want to deploy a network here, I see that channel one, uh, you know, about 3%, channel six is at 15%, and 11 is at uh, 3%. So channel six is probably a channel I'd want to stay away from uh, if I were on this uh, uh, channel here. And then, uh, of course, it gives you another number here, which is really nice, this on-channel networks, right? So um, how many networks are on channel one? How many networks are on channel six? There's seven here. How many networks are on channel 11? Uh, there's 11. And, uh, and uh, then it gives you the overlapping rights to the adjacent channels, which is even more important, is how many, how many adjacent channels are, are on this uh, uh, channel. And so this is a really neat tool that kind of um, uh, breaks down all the information for you if you need to make a decision on uh, uh, what channel to put your access point on. But what's really neat about Insider Office is it actually takes the guesswork uh, out of it for you. So if you actually go into physical mode here, and, uh, and select one of your uh, networks. So for instance, I'm gonna go ahead and select my uh, 2.4 gigahertz uh, network here. And, uh, and I'm currently on channel six. And sure enough, it's recommending everything but channel six right now. It looks like it's recommending channel 11 right now. And uh, this takes the guesswork out of it. This is great for non-experts to just kind of pull this tool out and if they, you know, you just need a quick, easy decision on where to place an access point, well, this this will do it for you. Um, if I select my uh, five giga, gigahertz band network right here, uh, it recommends channel 56 or now 52. If it toggles between two recommended channels, it means both of them are just about equal uh, uh, to be used. And so even switching this to 52 or 56 would be a little bit more ideal for me. And you can kind of see too why it's saying this, you know, here's 56 right here and here's 52 right here. And, uh, and it's probably looking at my, my, my data right now that I'm using, so it thinks that this is being used a little bit. Um, so it, you know, it's kind of a toss up there, but it's still really nice to have if you had a really congested Wi-Fi environment uh, uh, to have this guesswork taken out of it. Another really neat thing that you can do with Insider Office, of course, is you can actually start a recording and, uh, and you can kind of walk around and, and start a recording. And this recording can be opened up in our Channelizer tool, which I'll go over next. Um, and, uh, and uh, you know, and Channelizer 2 has a, a great option. So let's just say that there was a, some sort of interference that we couldn't identify here. Again, inside our office is a snapshot tool. And so um, if there was some sort of interferer here on the 2.4 or 5 gigahertz band, well, we would need to bust out a more appropriate tool to really deep dive into that interference um, or maybe look at a recording that an insider office user has recorded. And so that's kind of the next little bit here. Uh, uh, the next tool that we sell is Channelizer. The deep dive is what we like to market this as into spectrum analysis. Um, it's kind of like the, uh, the cable tester of Wi-Fi in a sense. Um, so like I was saying, you can locate sources of interference because we actually sell this tool with a directional antenna. Um, it's called the device finder and you can actually um, basically just kind of look for the interferer and you can just kind of walk around and angle this little antenna and it'll actually kind of alert you, kind of like playing hot or cold basically. And it'll let you know what direction it's in so you can actually locate these things, um, whether it's a cordless phone or, or anything like that. And, uh, and again, uh, it's really important to think about uh, Wi-Fi being half duplex here because um, uh, if you have like a microwave, which uh, does leak RF in the 2.4 gigahertz sometimes, uh, sometimes this will actually cause your other devices to wait their turn thinking that this microwave is a Wi-Fi device. Um, because again, only Wi-Fi is half duplex and these have to wait their turn to talk while this uh, burrito or whatever is done uh, cooking here in the, in the microwave. So it's really good to have this sort of um, spectrum analyzer to see this type of stuff. Um, here's a good signature of what, this is what a baby monitor looks like. These actually will hop from uh, channel to channel, which can just cause a lot of frustration for a Wi-Fi engineer or someone trying to fix someone's Wi-Fi um, because it could knock off all your devices on, on a network and you switch to another channel and then it knocks off all the devices on that channel, right? Because it will frequency hop. Um, Bluetooth is, is, is kind of similar. It's a, it's a really light uh, uh, RF 
frequency, but if you have tons of Bluetooth devices, then it actually can cause some interference. And it just hops all along the 2.4 gigahertz spectrum like this. Um, here's an analog wireless video camera. These were really nasty devices with these uh, really loud and uh, uh, wide signatures as well. This would just, this would completely knock off any devices on that channel. Um, and so you don't see these uh, uh, too much anymore with the invention of the Nest and, and Ring and, and those types of cameras that are, use Wi-Fi now. Um, one really nice thing about Channelizer is the spectrum data can be uh, paused or you know rewound or fast forwarded. Um, uh, so it's, it's a lot like a DVR. Um, so you can actually set Channelizer down and kind of forget about it for a couple hours if you can't catch the problem and wait for that issue to happen because sometimes there is some intermittent stuff that you just can't catch you know as soon as the engineer comes to fix the problem you, you never know what it might be it could be a microwave at lunch that's causing uh, some rf uh, interference it could be you know a, a bunch of different things and so channelizer is really great for just kind of setting it down for an extended amount of time see if you can catch that problem and then go back and and look at that data and uh, rewind it um, and then, of course, uh, we, we do have a report builder feature, which makes you look really professional. You can kind of throw all your findings in a report and type in uh, custom notes. Uh, we also include a lot of pre-filled literature so that the customer kind of understands what's going on. Really great for non-experts, again, um, where because we kind of uh, we break it down for you. We do a lot of the work for you with this, this reporting tool. Which is really nice. Um, and then finally, we act, we we also have a, a a bit of a relationship with Cisco access points that have the clean air functionality. Um, you can actually remotely log into uh, Cisco APs and uh, and look at the spectrum, even if it's miles away or on a different plant or different country, not planet, hopefully. Um, but uh, uh, basically, it's really nice to be able to remotely view that spectrum. You don't have to get up from your desk. And uh, uh, this is a pretty neat tool that uh, Microcom will also sell um, um, for us. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, show you guys what, what Channelizer can do. And I'm going to open up the software with the Wi-Spy DBX unplugged to kind of show you what, it, what the trial experience looks like. Uh, remember, you can get trials of these software of this software, even if you type in, for instance, Channelizer trial, uh, just even into Google, you should be able to get a trial of this software. And uh, and this is what you'll see. Well, since you do need a Wi-Fi to see your environmental RF, um, you can actually look at recordings, you can uh, look at lessons and things like that. Um, so you can kind of get a feel for how it works. But I'm going to go ahead and plug the Wi-Fi in and kind of show you what 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 it does here. And so this is going to be kind of similar to Insider Office. It starts populating the RF. It's going to show you all the networks, and you can actually kind of go into the uh, networks table and and uncheck or check what what you want here. It's the same exact filtering. Um, you, you can do a lot of the stuff that Insider Office did, um, but there's just a little bit more more things that you can do. Um, of course, it starts recording immediately, and so you can start walking around and, and kind of taking measurements and things like that. And meanwhile, it's being recorded the entire time, so you can always save that recording <clears throat> and look back at it later. Um, one thing I kind of wanted to show you guys is what if there was some sort of uh, in interferer here, right? Um, some sort of uh, non-Wi-Fi device, potentially. Um, and so this is a recording that one of uh, uh, an employee at MetaGeek took. And, uh, and th this is a great kind of illustration of, of, of how Channelizer can be useful. Um, so of course, I'm going to get my annotation tool out here. And uh, you can see that it's timestamped. So you can see this was taken at 9.20, 9.30 in the morning. And, uh, and right now, we're just playing the recording just as if this, uh, this person you know, had just started, right? And it looks like you see a couple of networks here. And it's just going to start kind of uh, playing. But you can see already in this waterfall view, you can see something coming up here. And that's what's really neat. Let's say this this user left this for, you know, looks like he left this recording for about 20 minutes. Um, so just like a DVR, you can actually just click and drag around this. And uh, boom, it shows you instantly this, uh, this interferer here, which looks like this tall spike um, on channel three and four. And if I were to, uh, uh, let's see what networks we had going on here. So it looks like we did have a, uh, a MetaGeek network here on channel five, and uh, and this this spike here occurred right in between channel three and four. So this would just wreak havoc on any clients. Uh, they they would wait their turn to talk for this, 
And so what exactly is this? What Channelizer is really useful for is it helps you identify these, this type of interferer. Um, we have a signatures library here with this interferers tab. So you can actually go down and select various uh, 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 signatures and drag it up and see if it matches. So this is an 802.11b signature, kind of like how I showed you, it's that curved shape. And uh, this doesn't quite fit. Um, you can kind of see uh, that this is 802.11b activity over here, some light activity. Remember that blue is less than 10% of the uh, spectrums being utilized, whereas red, that's 50% or more of the spectrums being utilized. So we really want to figure out what this red uh, loud uh, interferer is. Um, here's a, a 802.11g or n, that OFDM signature I was talking about earlier. Again, it doesn't quite fit. Clearly, this isn't Wi-Fi. Maybe it's an AV transmitter, so you can select this up. Again, it doesn't fit. The AV transmitter has these kind of shoulders, it looks like. And so what this ended up being, uh, this ended up being a cordless phone. And so if you drag the cordless phone signature up, you can kind of see that that, that matches pretty well here. Um, and so it really helps you kind of identify this, this, this type of issue. And of course, if you had a, um, if you had a customer that wanted to, uh, you know, kind of, needed to see this, you could build a report here and you could actually, um, let's see if I can grab that. Uh, you can actually put this information in a report. So let's say I wanted to uh, add this uh, utilization graph with this exact uh, with this exact signature. And it looks like, um, let me see if I can grab a, a density graph here. There we go. The density graph will actually show you the colors. And, uh, and basically whatever you have currently selected, it's gonna throw that in a graph and you can add you know, as many things as you want here. And it explains the uh, utilization, right? Um, so you don't really have to type anything if you don't, if you don't want to. Um, you can add the networks graph and show you the signal strength of, of what the Wi-Fi environment was looking like at the time. So again, this is something you can kind of build, uh, customize, and uh, you can, you can you know, print this out and hand this to a customer. It makes you look incredibly professional. And, uh, and the last thing I kind of wanted to show you guys um, as well is, uh, let's see here, there we go, uh, this, the Cisco clean air accessory. So if you were to, um, oh, it looks like I got to exit out of here. There we go. Um, so if you did want to uh, connect to a clean air AP, you just go to this clean air menu here and uh, you just need the IP address and the NSI key of this uh, remote access point and you can actually start uh, drilling into the, uh, the, the spectrum remotely. <clears throat> But what if there was, uh, uh, let's just say that uh, spectrum wasn't an issue, you, you, you know, the, the spectrum looks clean, there there's, doesn't appear to be any uh, issues with signal strengths or things like that, but you're still getting some sort of, uh, uh, maybe a client isn't connecting or some sort of uh, uh, problem that's still occurring. Um, and this is where kind of the next product that MediGeek sells comes into play here. And so, um, again, in the OSI model that, that we study in the CWNP program, um, it, it, it's really important to uh, think about, um, you start off with layer one, right? The physical layer. This is the actual spectrum analysis that we were performing, looking at, you know, making sure that uh, there, there's no interference or things like that. Um, if that still doesn't solve the problem, you need to go to the next layer, which is layer two, the packet layer. And this is where packet analysis uh, really comes into play. Um, so while spectrum analysis, just like I was showing you earlier, kind of shows you all the activity and the utilization on a channel, packet analysis will actually dive into that conversation between a client and an access point um, and, and show you, you know, top talkers and, and, uh, and, and give you a little bit more details into the actual conversations happening on a channel. And so again, it's really important to remember that uh, Wi-Fi's half duplex. I'm going to get really repetitive here, um, but only one device can talk on a channel at a time. And uh, the more devices you have, that limits the airtime for each device. And uh, this is really important to think about when we talk about data rates. And this is what IPA illustrates really well. And so let's say you have a network and you have this, uh, we'll just say this is an old Android phone. And it's, let's just say this guy is maybe 90 feet away from the access point and he's trying to check his email. It's gonna resort to this low data rate, right? This access point's gonna see this client device request to send. It's gonna say, check, I see that. And it's gonna start transmitting this data, to this client device. And uh, meanwhile, all these other devices, they have to wait their turn to talk, even if they're right next to the access point, right? And they're able to achieve this 54 megabit per second speed. 
it still has to wait. A lot of times here at MetaGeek, we refer to this as the uh, the slow kid in the back of the classroom. Uh, this one megabit per second cell phone device is just like the kid in the back that raises his hand and asks a really slow question. And meanwhile, everyone in the front who could, you know, you know, you know, ask uh, uh, quick questions or and, and get off the channel, uh, they have to wait until this this device is finished with its conversation or its question. And so uh, this is one thing that IPA illustrates really well. It will show you all the client devices connected to an access point and it'll show you their data rate, which is really valuable because you can see, you can see okay, well, this client device is, is operating at this low data rate. Uh, we're going to have to figure that out. And there's, there's multiple things you can do to fix that, but it's really important to know that that's what's going on. Um, IPA will, will show you uh, the, the wireless frame types in three different colors. It will show the uh, purple as uh, management frames, orange as control frames, and then the, uh, the, the blue frames are data frames. And uh, I won't get into this too much, um, but uh, 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 management frames basically help clients get on and off a network, right? And so uh, a good example of a beacon is uh, every access point or every router will actually beacon multiple, many times a second, like like a thousand times a second or something like that. It'll say, hey, I'm this network. I support this data rate. Um, I have this encryption type. You can connect to me. And, uh, and so IPA will show you all those beacons coming from access points. Probes are kind of the opposite of beacons. Probes actually come from the client device um, or, or the, the, you know, they're basically, um, a good example of a probe is uh, 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 your cell phone will actually probe for every network you've ever connected to. Um, for instance, uh, uh, when I leave my uh, my home here, my iPhone will actually say, it'll look for my network, Casey's network, and it'll probe for that constantly. It'll actually probe for any other network I've connected to. So for instance, the Boise Airport here, it's gonna say, hey, Boise Airport, are you there? Can I connect to you? Even though the Boise Airport's nowhere in sight, um, this is oftentimes why we actually recommend turning off the Wi-Fi on your devices because they are sending probes like 10 times a second or something like that, which does eat up battery life. Um, and then of course, authentication frames uh, just helps authenticate if you have uh, encryption. And then uh, the association frame is, is, is how the AP actually lets the client device associate um, uh, to, the, uh, to, to the network. Control frames aid in the, uh, um, uh, the delivery of the management frames. These make sure that the, uh, the, the management frames get delivered correctly. Uh, this is a lot like walkie-talkie talk, right? So an acknowledgement is kind of like saying Roger. Uh, Roger that, you know, um, uh, clients and access points have to acknowledge that they that they either received or didn't receive the data. And if they don't get an acknowledgement back, that's when it'll actually retransmit the frame or, or, or retry. Um, you'll oftentimes hear retry rate in, in, in Wi-Fi lingo. And that's just because it didn't receive an acknowledgement from its intended recipient. And, uh, and a block acknowledgement just simply lets more data pass um, so instead of, you know, data acknowledgement, data acknowledgement, uh, a block acknowledgement lets it go data, data, data acknowledgement, uh, which just lets more data get sent over. And uh, RTS and CTS, this just means request to send and clear to send. Um, again, kind of like basic Wi-Fi talk, you have to you have to have these types of things in order for uh, uh, wireless mediums to uh, to speak with each other, basically. And then, of course, the uh, data frames. Uh, this is your actual data. Let's just say it's a YouTube video, your Netflix or a video chat. Um, this is the actual, these are the frames that actually go all the way up the model, right? Where the, uh, the previous two frames I was talking about, those are very specific to Wi-Fi uh, data frames. Th th these go all the way up the, uh, the OSI model here, all the way out to the server, right? This, these go out to Google, for instance. And uh, QoS is quality of service. Those are just uh, higher priority um, data packets. And so uh, voice, for instance, is always going to be QoS because that's the most important thing uh, when you're having a, let's say, a Google video chat, you know, the video is going to stop working before the voice, right? You're always going to be able to hear the voice until it absolutely can't because that voice data is tagged with a QoS tag. Um, and so I wanted to talk a little bit about um, the airtime arbitration process, right? Um, how do you, since only one device can talk on a channel at a time, well, how do your devices figure that out? Um, how does my iPhone uh, get to talk before my MacBook, for instance? Um, and I won't get into this too much because as you, as you can tell, there's, there's a ton of uh, uh, stuff going on here. But the, the main gist of it is that our, our devices, Wi-Fi devices essentially roll the dice. It's just like a gambling game. 
Um, and so uh, in this example, this uh, we'll say this MacBook Air and this MacBook Air, they both roll, um, they both roll the dice. And uh, this MacBook just rolled a seven and this one rolled a nine. And so they start counting from zero to seven or zero to nine. And as soon as they hit seven, this station says, hey, that's what I rolled. I'm gonna request to send. And the uh, the access point says you're clear to send and they have their conversation. Meanwhile, this this MacBook, it waits its turn to talk. It, it backs off, right? It defers, but it keeps its counter of, of two here. Since it rolled a nine, it says, hey, I remember I rolled a nine. So I have two slots left. And so when this conversation's over with this uh, uh, MacBook and, and, the, and the access point, then uh, uh, they count to two, and then now this conversation gets to happen. And again, this is happening like a hundred times a second. It's 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 incredible the speed at which this stuff happens. Um, but that that that's kind of the main takeaway is your 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 clients will actually roll the dice here, and you can you can see this um, a little bit more in, in in IPA, which is which is pretty neat. Um, and so in the past, packet analysis was always done with a tool called Wireshark. It's open source, uh, lots of developers working on this. It's really quite complicated. I mean, you can you can apply filters if you know what you're doing. You can kind of visualize the data, but it, its strong point was never visualization. Um, its strong point was being able to dive in each frame. And if you know the error codes, right, if you're a certified wireless network expert, you can kind of understand what, what these uh, codes mean. And, um, you know that you, there's a lot of information here if you know what to do with it and so that's that was kind of the problem that ipa tried to solve ipa really tries to uh, visualize this for you and how we do that is with multi-layered pie charts um and so it's really easy to understand when, when you when you once you learn what it is and so this you know remember this entire pie chart represents a channel we'll just say this is channel one uh, in the 2.4 gigahertz band, and we just performed a packet capture. Um, what this very first little slice of pie is, is the network, right? Um, so this this network, for instance, was called Bronco Guest. We, uh, we have uh, uh, Boise State here and Boise State University here. And, uh, and so this very first network was eating up almost half of the entire airtime on channel one was due to this Bronco Guest SSID. The next layer out shows us the access point. Um, and so this was a, a specific access point. Um, if I were to click on this, it would show me the exact MAC address of this access point. Um, but it looks like there was just this one access point that was also contributing to about half of the airtime. The next layer out shows us the actual clients, right? Um, this could, could have been an iPhone. This could have been a student's MacBook. This could have been a, a Chromecast or something right on, on, on this uh, uh, channel. And so you can see that, you know, almost a quarter, if not more than a quarter of the airtime was consumed by this one client. So maybe this was a, a, a student watching Netflix or something. Who knows? Uh, but you know that it was data because finally the very outermost frame or the very outermost uh, uh, pie chart here, slice of pie, uh, this represents the actual frames. Um, and so this is the actual data frame, uh, 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 since blue is, is, is data. So this is actually a, a healthy conversation, most likely this is good data with a, a, a little bit of uh, uh, control frames here. Um, remember purple is management frame. So some of these other networks over here had some management issues going on here. Um, but uh, again, this looks pretty good because you know you do have to have a little bit of control frames to aid the delivery of these data frames. And so um, you know even even just looking at this picture, I'm able to gather a lot of information on 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 how this uh, channel is being utilized, uh, which is pretty neat. Um, and again, I kind of went over this already. The uh, data frames are marked as blue. Uh, management frames is uh, purple, and control frames uh, are the orange frames. You don't want to see too much of the uh, controller management frames. A uh, healthy network is going to actually have good data throughput, right? Um, you typically, don't want to see much ma much management frames. And I'll show you a good example of that here in a second. IPA works natively with uh, uh, our supported Wi-Fi adapters. We recommend the uh, Linksys WUSB 6300. Um, you should be able to get this from Microcom as well. Um, and uh, uh, we also are happy to take PCAPs from other sources. For instance, uh, MacBooks have a really great packet capture adapter just baked into them. Uh, the, the MacBook Air has a two by two spatial stream and the MacBook Pro is a three by three spatial stream. And what this means is uh, it, it, it can capture more. So if you have an access point that's an enterprise access point like a Cisco or Aruba, uh, Ruckus, um, you know, anything like that, uh, you're gonna be able to capture all the, uh, all the, a little bit more of the traffic, the more spatial streams you have. 
Um, and so the, this three by three spatial free MacBook Pro adapter is, is, is used a lot and you can generate a PCAP, which, which is happy to be imported into IPA. Um, you can also use these, uh, uh, you know, some enterprise grade APs will actually sniff packets for you and you can import those PCAPs into IPA. So yeah, I'll go ahead and show you uh, uh, a little, little demonstration here of IPA um, and, and kind of show you some, some things that you can do with it. Um, again, you can get a trial version of this if you just Google IPA trial and uh, you'll get to see these exact same sample files, which which I'll show you. Uh, the first one I really like to look at is uh, this was actually sent to me by a customer. And uh, uh, this was just called um, uh, it's just called multiple SSIDs. Um, but uh, remember how I told you too much purple is a bad thing. Well, this is a great illustration of, of management overhead. Um, and so this customer, this customer worked in a. Um, this customer worked in a, a university, I believe, some sort of school district. And uh, and he set up all of these virtual SSIDs, right? So he had a staff network, he had a, a student's network, he had a VR network and a guest network and bring your own device and a, and a second guest network, right? People really like, when, when they find out that they can make virtual SSIDs on their access points, they like to utilize that. But what they don't know is that creates unnecessary management overhead. So remember how I told you beacons uh, happen 10 times a second. Each network says, hey, on this network, I support these data rates. I support this encryption type. You can connect to me. Well, eventually, too many of that just causes management overhead. And that essentially detracts from the time that you could be using for actual data throughput with the device. And you can just see even with this airtime graph here that a quarter of the airtime was completely consumed by nothing but beacons nothing but these SSIDs beaconing out in, in the open. And there's not even any clients connected to this. There was a total of 10 clients and only 35 SSIDs. So even if, you know, the, basically long story short, this customer should probably only limit that to maybe three maximum virtual SSIDs if he can, and, uh, and let those clients, you know, connect to one of those three SSIDs. Um, just yeah, the, the, this is just a really great illustration of of management overhead, which which you can immediately see with uh, with IPA. Um, the other one I wanted to show you, the other PCAP um, recording I wanted to show you was uh, was this Netflix um, packet capture that that I actually took in the MetaGeek office. And so you can see this was I think this was just on um, I think this was on a, a channel in the five gigahertz band here. Yeah, channel 157. And I just did a packet capture with my MacBook Pro. And uh, and you can see that uh, uh, my MetaGeek network here was consuming most of the airtime here. And if you go the next layer out, I can see that my access point, which was called the MetaGeek Plank, that's the actual access point. We have five access points. And uh, you can see that this one was taking up all the airtime. And then if you actually go one layer out, you can start seeing the clients. So you can see Apple and it gives you a Mac address and you can actually dive into this Mac address and, and figure out whose device this was, right? Um, just based on the Mac address. And so I think this was my iPhone at the time. And this other client over here was the actual Apple TV that I was uh, broadcasting Netflix to. And uh, yeah, it's pretty neat to kind of dive in. You can see the data here. Um, you kind of see the block acknowledgement to make sure this data is you know, um, submitted without any sort of blocks. And uh, you can really dive in. And, and, and another neat thing is if I wanted to maybe, let's just say I was having issues with this Apple device, you can actually click on this little slice and dive into it. And this immediately filters out down to this client device in this conversation. So if you go into the packets view, which looks a lot like Wireshark, right? This should look familiar. You can start to kind of troubleshoot what you need to hear. Um, you can kind of look at uh, data rates over here. So we see that you know 69% of the time we were transmitting at a 24 megabit per second data rate. That's pretty good. That's actually a healthy network. I'd be concerned, remember, if this was at one megabit per second, right? The slow kid in the back of the classroom. But no, this was actually talking pretty quickly. And even better, if you go over here, you can see that there was uh, even 173 megabit per second, 28% uh, of the time. So there were some very quick speeds going on here. That's a pretty healthy network when you see those data rates. Um, there's nothing bogging it down that's, that's talking at a slower data rate, uh, which is really helpful to see. Furthermore, if you uh, really, you know, if you do know how to use Wireshark, one of the coolest things about this is you can actually go to file and then send to Wireshark and it sends your pre-filtered uh, data into Wireshark. So you don't have to, um, you don't have to worry about 
uh, looking at the entire packet capture in Wireshark and trying to filter in Wireshark, you can use IPA for quick filtering, just getting down to the conversations you need to with just a click and uh, and start kind of troubleshooting the packets in, in Wireshark if you know what you're doing there. I, I really only know a little bit about Wireshark, so I'm gonna close out of that. Um, finally, what's really neat about IPA is uh, as we have some pretty neat insights. And so I'm gonna go ahead and check the network that I'm troubleshooting, which is MetaGeek in this Analyze tab over here. And, uh, and it gives me this little issue. It says I have a high retransmit rate, 4.77%. Uh, and it gives me the MAC address of the client that is, re that is having retransmit issues. And it gives you solutions, which is uh, uh, pretty neat. You can actually, um, you know, kind of learn more and uh, and kind of see what the what they want. You know, remove non-Wi-Fi interference. Maybe there's uh, uh, overlapping channel interference, and it kind of gives you a little uh, a little blurb on what maybe you can do. And this is something we're constantly adding to the software. We're we're trying to get as smart as possible with these uh, solutions and uh, these observed issues. And so we're pretty excited to keep uh, updating this this software and, and and seeing where this goes essentially. And uh, yeah, with that, I think that's uh, that's about it. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and open the floor up for uh, any questions uh, that, that you guys might have. Hey Casey. hey, Casey, thank you so much for that presentation. We enjoyed it very much. And I do have a couple questions here for you. Um, let me go ahead and get started. Let's see here. Um, regarding um, Insider Office, does it work on all platforms like Mac, Linux, and Windows? I believe you mentioned something about that. Yeah, it works on Mac and Windows. Um, it doesn't work with Linux at the moment. Linux, I get it. Thank you. Okay, terrific. Yeah. Thank you. Next question here. Um, also regarding Insider Office, mm -hmm. um, what is the range uh, for that device to gather all the information from the area? Yeah, it really depends on the uh, Wi-Fi adapter that you're using. So, um, it, you can go in and on Amazon, for instance, you can get some pretty, uh, uh, pretty industrial, you know, enterprise Wi-Fi adapters with, you know, four antennas and three by three spatial streams. And you can see, you can see stuff from quite a long ways away. Um, and it really just depends on the antennas in your Wi-Fi adapter. If you're looking for the 802.11 information in terms of the uh, uh, spectrum analyzer, which is the Wi-Fi DBX. Um, you know, you could probably see you could probably see stuff from about 300 feet away or so, um, in in terms of RF, and it you know it, it'll it'll show down on the noise floor down there really low, um, but it, it it has a pretty decent range as well. I would say about 300 feet with the Y spy, and then the uh, uh, in terms of 802.11 information like network stuff and and signal strength, that really depends on the uh, chipset in your Wi-Fi adapter. Excellent, thank you very much. Next mm -hmm. question here for you. Um, will the spectrum analyzers reflect interference from frequencies outside of 2.5 or 5? Yeah, it just simply doesn't see it. Um, it, it, it basically only has a, a default uh, range, frequency range that it can scan. And that's just the, uh, I, I don't know the exact, I think it's like 2300 to 2800 or something like that, or maybe 2600. And then... 5300 to maybe 5400 megahertz um, so it just has a, a specific range that it can sweep it doesn't reflect or deflect it just simply doesn't see anything else besides those frequencies excellent thank you um, next question here for you um, and you may have touched on this what are the best channels to use for five gigahertz yeah it's a great question um, i always recommend using uni one and uni 3 first before diving into uni 2 which is essentially the middle um, of of the five gigahertz band um, simply because the middle of the five gigahertz band which we call uni 2 and uni 2 e which stands for extended um, those channels are used for uh, dfs so doppler radar events and so sometimes those doppler events can cause issues and so i always recommend using uh, uni 1 which I think is uh, off the top of my head, I think it's like channel 36 through channel 56 maybe or something like that. I don't have my cheat sheet in front of me right now, but uh, yeah, Uni 1 and then Uni 3 before you have to start using Uni 2 and Uni 2E is, is my recommendation. Thank you for that. Next question here for you. Um, does MetaGeek have um, a forum and can anyone join? 
Yeah, we actually, we do have a forum. Um, even if you just Google MetaGeek forum and anyone can join, I will say that we don't, uh, we don't look at it a whole lot. Every once in a while, we'll see some sort of activity on there and we'll try and respond to questions. Um, really, I would use the support.metageek.com website uh, over the forum just to, because uh, you can actually comment on our materials and our educational uh, articles and videos and things like that. And that, that would probably be a little more effective um, we do want to figure something out here shortly, so it wouldn't hurt to kind of get familiar with our forums as we might revamp that here soon enough. But again, support.metageek.com is probably your best resource to kind of comment on our articles and, um, um, and, and, and feel free to shoot any questions to support at metageek.com as well. If, if you have any Wi-Fi questions, um, we, we'd be happy to get back to you uh, there as well. Excellent. Thank you so much for that. Um, you mentioned trial versions. Um, can you tell me um, about trial versions? Which ones Which ones can we actually um, uh, get a hold of? Yeah. So you can actually get a hold of all three of the pieces of software that I uh, uh, showed. Um, Insider Office, Channelizer, and IPA are all available to uh, get trials for. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that uh, with Channelizer, for instance, you do need to have the actual hardware, which is the YSPY DBX Spectrum Analyzer. Um, and uh, with IPA, you do need some sort of uh, tool that can generate PCAPs or uh, a packet capture, whether that's the uh, supported Wi-Fi adapter or a MacBook Pro or something like that before you can get real environmental information, right? And then inside our office, you don't need anything. Uh, you just need a chipset. You just need a Wi-Fi adapter, which is usually built into your laptop. Um, but again, you can use the Y-SPY with Insider Office if you want to get that spectrum uh, analysis. So it, it might be worth picking up a Y-SPY DBX if, if you do want to get that RF. And, and we don't offer a trial on the, uh, the hardware or anything. Understood. Excellent. Thank you. Next question mm -hmm. here. Is there a limit of uh, number of devices that can be added to the channelizer? Um, a limit to the number that can be added trying to think what he's what 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 this question means exactly but uh um if he's talking about wi-fi devices um you know that there's there's really no limit you know it, it's going to see everything that's out there um or in terms of networks at least right um and so you know if, if there's a ton of network information coming in at channelizer it might start to slow down and so the the the, the faster your computer and the cpu is the better in that sense if you have a really congested wi-fi environment um, but no, theoretically, there, there's no limit to, you know, how many uh, networks it can see or anything like that, um, just because, the, you know, only so many networks can exist in one place at, at the same time, if, if that's what he means. Um, if he's talking about plugging in uh, spectrum analyzers, um, you, you know, we, we recommend you, you can use two or three or multiple devices in, in Channelizer um, in, in terms of spectrum analysis. It just makes the sweep time faster. So if he's talking about um, spectrum analyzers, you, you can use multiple. You wouldn't want to use more than two or three, though, because um, you just wouldn't need to. Excellent. Thank you. You definitely answered our question on that. Um, can you give us um, an overview of maybe what's happening now with the new products? Is there yeah. is there something on the horizon that you might be able to touch on? Yeah, um, I'm not sure how much I can touch on it right now, but we are excited to release a couple new products. Um, we're we're kind of working on uh, uh, we're kind of working on a a, a Wi-Fi scanning kind of subscription service right now. Um, that that that's in the works. We'll we'll see how that turns out. We're calling that Insider Plus, and then uh, and then we're also working on a a mobile tool here shortly. Um, because that's a big pain point now uh, for a lot of our customers is, you know, right now you kind of have to haul a laptop around and a, and a, and a spectrum analyzer to, to see information. So um, we are working on a, a, a you know, uh, kind of a solution for uh, uh, mobile users that want to use an uh, Android or an iPhone. And so hopefully we'll have something uh, uh, by the next time I uh, do one of these uh, webinars. Hopefully I can give you some more information on that. But that's that's kind of where we're looking uh, in terms of the horizon. Excellent. Thank you so much for that. Um, you had mentioned a cheat sheet for channels. Is that something that's available for anyone to see? Great question. I actually got it from, uh, uh, it was w WLPC last year in uh, Phoenix, Arizona. Um, and I think you can still get it from their website. So if you go to, you might just want to Google WLPC. Um, which uh, stands for Wireless LAN uh, Professionals, I think, Conference. Um, if you uh, if you just Google WLPC maybe 2018 
gosh, I don't know if cheat sheet will really work for you, but basically it was just a, um, a, a material that uh, Keith Parsons it, what is his name. He actually provided it and uh, it just kind of, it breaks down the 2.4 and the five gigahertz channels and, and shows you kind of where they all lay and, and kind of, you know, um, since you can have 40 megahertz or 80 megahertz wide channels in the five gigahertz, it gives you, you know, how to uh, name those and things like that. So again, uh, I would poke around on WLPC's website and uh, and see if you can find that, uh, uh, you know, five gigahertz. Uh, yeah, I call it a cheat sheet. I'm not sure what they call it. It's just a, a kind of just shows you the five gigahertz overlay, basically. Excellent. Thank you, Casey. And mm -hmm. uh, just an FYI, you had mentioned CWNA at the beginning of the webinar, and our academy division offers those courses. So I oh, just wanted great. to mention that. So we're well that's aware. Awesome. That's <laughs> so great. that's very good. Excellent. Casey, thank you so much for answering all of those questions. And thanks to everyone for joining today's webinar. If you have any further questions, please feel free to contact your sales rep, or you can email us at sales at microcomtech.com. And if you wish to view the products mentioned or shown here today, please visit us at www.microcom.us. And please remember, this webinar presentation has been recorded and will be uploaded to our Microcom YouTube channel so you can view it again. Casey, appreciate your time today. And as always, loved all of your information and your presentation today. Thanks, Julie. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you. Bye-bye and have a great day.